Hello, hello, hello. You are the first one here today, Jonathan. Hello. <laughs> okay, so we have Rachel Coleman, and this is an exciting call. I'm not even going to attempt to repeat your credentials because there's so many letters. I'm not 100% sure what they mean. But, um, <laughs> we can talk about that. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm in, I am interested in that because that goes along to who do you go to for different things. Do you know what I mean? In different, I took singing lessons. It was brilliant for learning. I could place my voice in different parts of my face, mm -hmm. but I'm probably not for like certain throat issues or voice problems. You know what I mean? So, um, but I asked to have Rachel on this call because I had a session with her and I found it hugely helpful. And, um, and also overwhelming when I realized the extent, the extent of the upkeep and what we in fact need to do to take care of our voices. And that's why when you offered before the call, Rachel, should I have charts? I was like, no, no, no charts. <laughs> because the minute they start showing anatomy that I really just want to give up the ghost, then I'm just like, get me a bottle of some alcohol and we'll pretend it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can we start please with 10 year old Rachel where were you what were you wanting to be when you grew up what was your dream what was your plan? oh my god what a great question absolutely an actress a hundred percent I yeah. I wanted to be on the stage a hundred percent were you in like plays and everything and oh school? yeah yep yep plays all that stuff dancing you know just kind of the classic kid who wants to sing, dance, and act. And so did you, did you pursue that into college and everything? And how? I did. Um, I did pursue acting into college. The problem is, is that when I was a teenager, I fell in love with um, classical theater and specifically Shakespeare. And I, you know, I wish, I wish that I had been encouraged to think about things a little differently, but as a petite brunette wanting to play a bunch of Shakespearean heroines, I've, you know, I was never, I, you know, all those parts are written for, you know, Rosalind, you know, they're all written for kind of tall blondes. That's like half the plot point is, oh, they can be confused with a man. And, yeah. and at a certain point I was like, you know, can I actually make a career as a Shakespearean actress in the States? What is that really going to look like? Do I want to be waiting tables? You know, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of creativity. I'm also a bit of a pessimist. <laughs> And I was like, this isn't going to happen for me. You know, who am I? And so I kind of took a turn um, in college to, to more academic pursuits and then later discovered that there is kind of this world in, in healthcare and in the sciences that caters to performers and that, you know, my skills and my interests could, could be of use. Um, and so that's, that's how I got from 10 year old Rachel to, I won't say how old Rachel, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> speech so this, pathologist. World, this world that you, because, because I hate to admit it, I might have that pessimist in my soul as well, which yeah. is the reason I kind of swerved and didn't first, didn't stick with what, like I wanted to, yeah. when I wanted, I got there eventually, but not the way I was, but yeah. First of all, the Shakespearean exp Shakespearean experience. Talk about vocal training. But yes. second of all, when you swerved, was your passion for this new avenue so great that it was like, oh my God, I'm here? Or did you ever, at times, want to just like go up to the performers and knock them off the stage and say, get out of the way? <laughs> That's such a great back. question. I think in college there was a lot of that because I was really conflicted about letting go of this, you know, lifelong passion and yeah. dream. And, and it, I felt very conflicted about it. Um, but then once I started studying and, and once I really, you know, I, I also really enjoyed um, the science behind what I was learning. And it turned out that I had a lot of, you know, an equal passion for, neuropsychology and and cognitive communication and and kind of all these other areas that I don't think I ever would have explored had I just stuck to performing um it's like you said you know you you end up in a place and you can feel really grateful for the experiences you had because it led you 
to where you are. I am incredibly thankful that I have that performance background. And I'm also incredibly thankful that I took time away from it and really kind of delved into linguistics and, you know, cognitive psychology and neurology, neurolinguistics, all of that stuff. And I can now kind of draw from these very different worlds to help people, which is pretty amazing in, in my opinion. So when you help people, when you coach people, how does the cognitive psychology come into it? Do you start off with the physical aspects and then if you notice something else happening, address that? Or do you, are you thinking it in the background while you're treating them or are you addressing it with them? Or because we had talked before the call about my interest in mind body and full disclosure, everyone. And I said, I'm not gonna be as authentic as I always am. This time I'm gonna be slightly authentic. Um, I went to Rachel because, um, because you get tired. I didn't take like a break for like three years and you get tired and you, you start to get sick and you don't know what's wrong with you. And, and I went to Rachel with these kind of like vague and this and that, and I've got this ongoing and that ongoing. And it felt very, she was asking me very clinical questions, which I was like, oh my God, I'm too scared to find out. And then I got off track with my doctors as well thinking it wasn't my voice, it was something else, it was this or that. So when you deal with a patient like me, who just finds the whole thing incredibly scary, I mean, nine out of 10 times, we've been on Google every night for the last five years. Maybe that was just me, but what is your approach? What is your thought process? What are you doing? Yeah, that's, there's so many great kind of questions in there. In terms of like the, the you know, Cognitive component, I mean, to be clear, as of, you know, now my career has landed in a place where I specialize in, in voice therapy, vocal rehabilitation, but that's kind of one subspecialty of the world of speech pathology. I, for many years, did not exclusively treat voice patients. I treated stroke patients. I treated brain injury patients. I treated a wide variety of patients. And, and even though there isn't a direct relationship between somebody who sustained a traumatic brain injury and someone who is a performer with, with vocal fold problems, you do pick up things along the way and it just makes you a better clinician. That being said, I take a metacognitive approach to working with patients. It is of the utmost importance to me that everyone I work with understand what's happening with their body, understand the rationale behind what we're doing. Um, because I think, you know, I've had a lot of patients and clients who can kind of go through the motions. Oh, well, somebody told me to do this. This is my warm up. You know, these are my exercises. And I said, well, what are you doing? What can, like, tell me a little bit about what you're feeling or why you're doing it. And they go, I don't know. <laughs> and, and I think it's so important that if you're doing something, know why you're doing it. Yeah. I do a Buddhist chant while looking at Pinterest. <laughs> I figure warm up the brain. <laughs> yes. Soothe the soul. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it does anything vocal warm-up wise, but you gave me one and I still do. Um, oh, good. Yeah. And, and so, okay. So what do you wish we knew? And also, oh, I should preface, cause we've had a lot of people join since we, since we rolled up you guys, this isn't one of those calls where you can only ask quirky questions. I mean, Rachel, obviously can't give out actual medical advice on a YouTube show and that probably wouldn't be proper but if you've got questions about your voice I'll, I'll leave it to Rachel to handle what she can and can't answer feel free to type in question ahead of time in the chat box and we'll definitely send um forward it to Rachel so what do you wish we knew oh like, my goodness so many things I give like an hour-long talk at conferences for voice actors about like, here's all the things I think you should know. <laughs> um, so we could talk for a long, long time about this. I think the first thing that not enough performers know is that your voice is a muscle, right? So mm -hmm. your, your sound is coming out from your vocal folds. 
right? Which is part of a larger system of how the voice works. But at its most basic level, your vocal folds are kind of two um, sort of sheaths of tissue sitting above your air pipe and the, that vibration of those muscles. I know, kind of gross. <laughs> I'm just not good with biology. That's my own I know, I know. <laughs> but the vibration of that tissue of those muscles is what's, what's making the sound that you and I are kind of listening to and creating right. in this moment. And the reason why I kind of want people to know that is muscles have wear and tear, muscles get fatigued, muscles get injured. You know, performers think of themselves as artists, um, but they don't think of themselves as athletes. Mm. And yet, you know, if I, and I may have even talked to you about this um, when we first met, you know, if, if you were on your feet for six hours straight, we are. That's an incredibly <laughs> athletic endeavor. And so if you think about narrators who are kind of in a booth working on a project, trying to record, you know, six hours of, of product, you know, that is an incredibly athletic endeavor. And never even because I stand narrating. So it is every day, six hours. Mm -hmm. I never even thought of that. I thought standing was better for you physically than sitting in. Anyway. Oh, I meant metaphorically, like just like okay. the idea of like being on your feet. Like if you were on your feet for six hours a day, walking or running okay. Okay. or you yeah. know, jogging, like moving around, you'd say, man, that's exhausting. So we have and, to respect and vocally, the instrument. Vocal, exactly. Your vocal yeah. folds are moving. They're vibrating. They're working yeah. for hours a day. That's tiring. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And guys, for the record, we all kind of know that, but we probably should believe it. <laughs> I, um, I'll i never forget this. I was a guest at an audiobook workshop, one of Johnny Heller's workshops, um, and there was an audience member. And it's funny because when she said it, I was like, I'm going to steal this. And sure enough, I, I use it all the time. Um uh, we were talking about this and how, you know, yes, your, your vocal folds need breaks. They're a muscle. If you're on your feet for 10 hours a day, like you're not going to finish whatever you're doing on your feet and then go run a marathon. You're, you're going to take a break. Your vocal folds need breaks as well. And she said, you know, I've been doing this for my entire career, not taking breaks, but just because I can doesn't mean I should. And I said, yeah. yes. So that is the new mantra. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> And you get it. And the, the other, the reason I think we're hesitant is because you feel like you've got into it. And then if you stop, you're not going to want to go back. And I, when I did force myself to take breaks, I, but, but cognitively your concentration, your focus goes down and you end up taking longer in the booth anyway. But when I was taking breaks, I was coming out talking loudly to my husband and my bird and chatting away and like, that's not, and I was trying to tell a narrator the other day, you know, they're probably looking at me going, I'm not taking advice from you, but I was telling them what about breaks. I've already yeah. done what I've done for so long. I'm not going to change now. It works for me. So people are very resistant, but I think if we want what we want at the end of the day, it literally does take less time if you take breaks. And I think you bring up so many good points. You know, I tell patients, I'm the expert on what I know, you know, the medical side of things, the coaching side of things. You're the expert on you. You're the expert on your body. So if you're coming to me and you can record for eight hours straight with no breaks and you have no issues with the sound quality and that you're telling me that hour seven sounds just as good as hour nine and you never get hoarse and you never lose your voice and you're never straining, I'm not here to tell you you're doing it wrong. You know, right, that, that right. would be kind of strange of me if, if you're feeling fine and, and you're meeting your goals. Um, but I think for most people, I'm having these conversations because they're coming to me saying, you know, by the time I'm at the end of my recording session, the quality is different and I have to go back and I have to re-record it, or it's taking me so much longer because I have to keep redoing things or I'm hoarse at the end of the day. And that's when we have to say, let's take a deep dive into, you know, stamina and pacing and how can we adjust that so that you're not bumping up against these problems. And do you know what? I, I, I'm really obstinate. I'm like, I'm 
I will not listen to other people. Like, I think I'm the expert on me a little bit too much. I ran an experiment <laughs> last week mm -hmm. and it was really, really eye opening. I recorded for four hours with no breaks, just four hours, right? In the booth. And um, the next day, I recorded the same thing and I took breaks. And I ran them both through Positron, which checks for pickups. And the day that I took breaks, I had one pickup in two finished hours of audio. The day that I didn't take breaks, I had I, <laughs> an embarrassingly much larger number than one pickup. Yeah. I mean, it could be because that was the same thing I was recording that was my first day as opposed to my second day. But yeah. I suspect that part of it was focus, that you yeah. think you're great, but you don't realize until, you know, you don't, you think you're doing better than you are. Maybe you get tired. tired. There's sort of, you know, there's the mental focus and, oh, I'm in a groove. I'm in a groove. And then there's the muscular. <coughs> Oops, sorry. I got very enthusiastic and knocked over my water <laughs> almost. Um, there's the, the vocal focus. Mm -hmm. And again, those are muscles. They get fatigued and, and everybody has different, you know, constraints for the work that they're doing. I've worked with voiceover narrators who were um, doing like Siri types of um, recordings where mm. they needed to have a very flat intonation and just the repetitive mono pitch was exhausting. And they kept going, Rachel, why is this so much harder than anything I've done? And it feels like um, it should be easier. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, so, so every job is a little different and has different requirements, but I think, you know, breaks give the body time to relax and reset as opposed to go, 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 you know, for four hours. That's, that's a pretty big ask of muscles. Okay. So what else should we know? So another thing that I think is really important for people to know who are vocal professionals is that um, if you need help, you have to know who to go to. Um, yeah. There is a whole kind of medical subspecialty of people who can help, but for some reason, this information is really not out there in many areas of performance. And so people wind up going down the wrong path um, when they run into trouble. And that, that kind of drives me nuts. Um, it is not the performer's fault. If anything, I think it's the medical community's fault for not doing enough outreach and kind of making this public information. So what I would say is if you are someone who is running into vocal problems and you are not sick and the problems have been lasting for more than two weeks. Yeah, this is the stuff that I really would love to hear because you don't know. It's like yeah. any health stuff. You're like, should I go on Google? You go on Google and then you find out about that tumor oh, yeah. and cancer that you have. And then you don't know what else to do. You call the doctor and they're right. like, don't go on Google and you're fine. Take more right. medicine. Right, right, right. So, okay, right. so if right. it's lasted longer than two weeks. Yeah, so if you're having a voice change and you are not sick, you otherwise feel fine. And the voice change is lasting for two weeks or more, and it's not getting any better. You should go to the doctor and have it looked at. And Google is not the doctor. <laughs> you need someone who's actually going to take a look at the muscles of your voice, which are your vocal folds. The type of person that you want to go and see is an ear, nose, and throat doctor or an ENT. Another fancy term for that in the States is an otolaryngologist. Okay. Which, you know, medical term for ear, nose, and throat doctor, but here's the most important thing. And this, this is kind of my big, like soapbox for performers. E N T. Those are three different body parts, ears, nose, and throat. Yes. They're all connected. And that's why those physicians get trained in all three of them, but they subspecialize within the field of ENT. So you performers need to see someone called a laryngologist, which is the T in ENT. Those are physicians that only look at vocal folds all day long. 
And they put that thing up your nose. Yes. So there are two ways that they look at your vocal folds. Neither of them are particularly delightful, um, but it doesn't last very long. So, so one way they look is they take a, like a, an endoscopy type of camera. It looks like a string of spaghetti and they thread it through the nose and then it dangles down your throat and looks down at your vocal folds. And then the other type of camera that the more specialized physicians have is called a rigid scope. It's not flexible. It looks like a metal, um, just like a long metal rod, not that long actually. And they just slide it along your tongue, just to the back of your tongue. And there's a little camera at the end that looks down your throat like a periscope. Oh, that one goes in your mouth. Yeah. So what they do is they hold out your tongue and then they just slide it along the tongue and it just peers. It doesn't that go all the way hurt. back. That wouldn't hurt as much, would it? I wonder nope. if they would do that one in this country. In America, do they give you numbing stuff when they go out through your nose? See here, yeah. they don't. Aww. And here, if you complain, they say, what are you, a wimp or something like that? It's upper lip, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think her exact Stiff words nose. were, I don't know why you're reacting so badly. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> so, oh, I love that thing with the, with the mouth. Yeah. So it's called, it's called a rigid it. scope. Um, I will say, you know, not all physicians, it, it is a much higher, it's a much more difficult skill. I think for the physician, it's kind of trickier. It gives you a better view many times. Um, and as someone, so in addition to my private practice, I, I work um, with some of the top laryngologists in New York City. I work at their practice uh, two days a week, seeing patients with them in their clinic. And so when I'm in the hospital clinic with them, depending on your age and your complaint, there are times where they may choose to use one exam versus the other. So you can request it, but they may have a reason to say, actually, no, I want to go in. Like, for example, if they're going in through your nose, we can listen to you speak or do different tasks. So let's say I have a patient who I also work with a lot of singers. So let's say I have a patient who's a singer and he says to me, I have no falsetto anymore. My upper register is gone. Right. And when I sing this, I'm a Broadway performer. And when I sing this note in my song, it just cuts out and nothing happens. We may use that flexible scope through the nose and we may get the camera in place and we may say, OK, show us. Sing, sing the line and show us what happens. And then we can catch it in real time. Whereas if we're holding your tongue and sliding a camera through, we've got your tongue. You literally can't say anything but E. Okay. So you know, it gives us a lot of useful information. We get a closer view, um, but we're limited in the types of tasks we can ask you to do during the exam. Okay. Okay. So first step, if you, and that's for voice change. What about for voice? Um, the reason I went to you was a persistent cough and I'm finally giving in thinking maybe it's reflex and maybe there are other ways to deal with reflex. Mm -hmm. Um, but that persistent cough, I mean, at what point do you, how do you diagnose if you're finding yourself with a cough, if you're finding yourself yeah. with a sore throat, you can yeah. feel like it's all connected and you don't know where it's stemming from. How do you know if it's your voice? Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, again, what's happening with a cough, it's your vocal folds smacking together to protect your airway. So it's the same I muscles. remember you saying that because I was coughing like, <laughs> all day. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, again, I think it's a different situation if you got an upper respiratory infection and you have a cough, you know, that's, that's not a voice problem. That's an illness, mm -hmm. you know, during the current era, if you have COVID, you're going to, you know, you're going to cough. You're probably going to be coughing for quite some time afterwards. That's often the last have, thing Have you to had go. patients that have had COVID? Have they had a hard time coming back? Has it affected their vocal careers? We have had a little bit of it. So again, because I'm in New York City and, and the physicians that I work with um, specialize in performers, I see a lot of Broadway. Broadway is sort of the biggest um, yeah. population I see besides audiobook narrators and voiceover artists. Um, and for many, many of you know, Broadway was hit really hard mm. by COVID very early. Um, so we've had a lot of performers recovering from COVID. 
it's interesting because most of them seemed to not be as impacted by like the coughing or that aspect of it, but the time away Mm. when Broadway shut down and they were alone in their apartments for a year doing, you know, much, much less with their voices, sometimes nothing. Then when they went back to work, they, a lot of them were struggling because they had gotten out of shape vocally. I wonder if their career, the physical aspect of their career dancing, most of the time singing, Mm -hmm. they probably went into COVID in better respiratory shape than most of us. Oh, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. This is not a patient popular. I mean, certainly there are examples of Broadway performers that you know, some that passed away, unfortunately, very early on, and, and some that were very sick. And obviously, I can't, you know, yeah. generalize, um, since I'm not a member of that community. But yes, as, as a general rule, that is a very healthy group of people, physically, yeah. and, and from a respiratory standpoint. Um, now, there's a question. Um, I step into my booth to narrate at 9 9 a.m. At this time, my voice is rich and bassy. However, by 2 p.m., my voice tends to rise in pitch and I lose that nice, rich bass sound. Any tips for retaining my low tones throughout the day and not just the morning? That's such a great question. Um, So much to unpack with that question. So I think it goes back to our original discussion about pacing and breaks. And I would have to kind of hear you and get to know you a little more and ask more questions to determine if this is really the cause. But I'm wondering if you're losing some of your range because you're fatiguing or you're getting strained and you may want to consider building a break in. And when I mean a break, I don't, I don't just mean being quiet and eating bonbons. <laughs> I mean, you know, in addition to rest, you may need to be doing some vocal exercises to, to reset those muscles and kind of help you find those rich tones that you had in the morning. I did think bonbons. I mean, bonbons sound lovely. I like watching true crime TV. (laughs) There should definitely be that too. I mean, it's like the Pinterest, you know, you have to take care of the soul. (laughs) but, But don't the vocal exercises, they're using your voice, aren't they? Yes. Yes. So there's this fine line between voice use that is therapeutic, kind of stretching, low impact exercises, exercises that are designed to alleviate tension, things of that nature. And then, you know, for you talked about like shouting at the bird, you know, it's not necessarily a break if you step out of the booth and you're shouting to someone, that's just a different kind of, you know. I'm not, for the record, I'm not shouting at him, I'm shouting with him. (laughs) He's shouting louder. (laughs) <laughs> which again is around the room and screams woohoo so who could not join in <laughs> that's fair that's fair um so I think that that's you know part of it is I would want you know if, if you were my client I would want to talk about your warm-up routine I would want to talk about your pacing you know do you just record from nine to two straight do you take breaks are you using vocal exercises during those breaks to reset. And if that's not working, you know, then we might want to get a physician on board to see, you know, hmm, what is, is there a medical explanation? And how does it normally work? I know I did a consultation with you. I think the day, I'm not sure if this was the one, the day after I did a consultation on you, my GP came back and said, let's test you for lupus. So then I spent like an entire week on Google. Like freaking out like what is lupus I think that was before the hernia (laughs) so so but I remember meeting with you for a consultation how do you book how often do you see people how does it work how does it determine how many sessions they'll need etc etc that's such a great question so I think another thing to keep in mind is that there is the medical world of voice care and vocal health. And then there's kind of the performance world of voice care. Um, And when you think about the medical world, you're thinking about physicians 
you're thinking about speech therapists, people who have, you know, degrees from medical institutions or, you know, of that nature who are licensed to do what I call rehabilitation, meaning you're helping somebody with some kind of injury or impairment get back to where they used to be. So what about, what about, let me steer you this way. And I won't use your name just because the person didn't put question in front. So I'm not going to say their name publicly what about our gentleman that asked the question what which avenue would they be how would yeah so the other avenue is coaching you know in addition to being a medical professional with my theater training and my theater background and and my experience rehabilitating performers I'm also able to take what I know about the medicine and and the science and the information about vocal health and coach people who don't have injuries, but are running into issues. And so I'm not rehabilitating them because they don't have a medical problem or a medical injury per se. But my, you know, advice to performers of all kinds is you never get too good for a coach. It's not like Audra McDonald or any, you know, any kind of professional singer or any kind of professional athlete, for example. My sister went to school with her. I remember she came over to our house once and I was like, oh my God, wait, that name's familiar. She's like, oh Oh yeah, that was a little girl that came. I know she's like a superstar. She's got a really good voice. Uh, That is an (laughs) understatement. Yes. Yes. She's yes. All hail queen Audra. Um, (laughs) So, so what I would say is, you know, you never get too good for a coach even if you're at the top of your game, it's always useful to have another set of eyes and ears to, you know, to help you and to help you navigate, like, can I do this a little better? Can I do it a little more efficiently? Um, again, you know, I'm not trying to say that the people who are doing their jobs without any difficulty, without any complaint, all need a coach necessarily. But if you're running into issues and they don't seem to be a medical problem, um, it, it, you know, then I put my coaching hat on and I'm seeing someone, you know, I'll see a client for a consultation. I ask a lot as you learned, you know, about medical history. I ask about like, how, tell me in a very detailed way, what's going on with your voice. And I have to tease out, is this a medical problem? Is this a case for rehabilitation? And if that's the case, I send them to the doctor. Yeah, you knew more than my doctors. I went back to them the next day with your questions. They were like, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We'll and, look and, into that. Nobody ever got back to me. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the important thing about making sure you have the right doctors yeah. on your team. You know, yes, if you go to your GP and you ask those questions, they can't answer. You need someone with a very specialized type of camera who is looking directly at your vocal folds to answer okay. those questions. So I have a question. Yes. Pretend that I didn't have the cough and that like, so on a perfect day, um, I'm a big believer in going to coaches and I'm thinking, what would I go to a vocal coach for on a normal mm-hmm. recording schedule if it weren't for that other thing that happened? Mm-hmm. And I think my biggest thing, which came to light when I, when I had that singing thing was, um, I think narrating for six, seven years, you develop habits and I've learned nothing to do with something wrong with my voice, but I, I use my lower register. I talk from here. I don't ever move it up. It's a bad habit. It's just most comfortable there. But in my line of work, I have to sound like a female sometimes, (laughs) you know, often. So what would you say about is it different warm ups that retrain you to use different parts of your vocal range? Or is it singing lessons that would help with that? Or is it coaching? It's not medical. Would it be? Yeah. Well, so there's a couple of different components. So the first thing I would say is when I'm working with clients or patients, I like to distinguish between vocal register or pitch versus vocal placement like where you feel the tone coming from in your body. Okay. Okay. Because I think a lot of the times we confuse those things. And I think the distinction is important. So I can talk in this voice like this, and I'm, I'm talking in like a female range. That's quirky best friend. But yeah, quirky best friend. (laughs) Reality, Kim Kardashian. We all know her. Reality TV star. (laughs) 
So it was a high, you know, higher pitch than what you were using, but the focus of the tone was all in my throat. You know, it was this kind of pressed, gravelly, throaty sound. Whereas now I can use a much lower, lower tone, but I'm not talking in my throat quite as much, you know, now I'm talking in my, so I'm doing all kinds of weird sounds for you guys, just right. to, just for the purpose of demonstrating that, you know, pitch is one parameter that you can change. Placement is another parameter that can change resonance, where your sound is coming from. And so if, if you were my client and, and, you know, that was your complaint, I would really kind of delve in with you. Well, is your complaint that your voice is in your, that you're using this kind of throaty sound is your complaint that the pitch is too low? Um, is it both of those things? And then, yes, I would be giving you exercises to say, okay, you need to, you want to have full access to your full range. Are you stretching? Are you using your full vocal range before you step in the booth? Are you making sure that you're feeling your voice kind of resonating in all those different areas so that you have flexibility? Um, and then the final thing, and this is like, a whole hour long talk in itself is that the voice changes throughout the lifespan. Nobody talks about this. And a lot it's of per- too depressing. It is too. De- <laughs> yeah. I mean, talking about aging is super depressing just in general, <laughs> but I think particularly for performers and, and audiobook narrators and voiceover artists in particular, because it's something that you can do through your whole life. I see many of them who run into these issues, you know, in their seventies and they'll say, you know, my voice is, it doesn't have the range that it used to. I don't have the stamina that I used to. And it's because the muscles are changing and their age related changes. And for women, the component that isn't really talked about is that there are postmenopausal changes to the vocal folds and that can affect your pitch and that can affect your range. And am I right that Things like health, food, exercise, huge, huge impact on slowing down those changes. So I'm I not can't... saying that I'm planning on doing yeah. any of those things. <laughs> I'm putting so, it out there for the interested yeah, yeah, audience. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't really comment on like the hormonal because I'm not an endocrinologist and I'm not a physician of any kind. So I can't really comment on like whether or not those lifestyle changes are, are slowing down the changes to the vocal folds, but as a a speech pathologist and a voice therapist, what I can tell you, again, it all goes back to the fact that they're muscles. Use it or lose it. If you want to keep your range, you got to work your range. You got to be stretching those muscles every day. You got to be doing, you know, your vocal warmups and your vocal exercises. And you, you know, will, will you sound like you're 25 when you're 90? Probably not, but can but the you? Goal, the goal isn't to sound right young or right. old. A, a deeper voice isn't. It can be better. In I mean, yeah. it's just yeah, depending yeah. on the part. The yeah. goal is to have control over it. Oh, exactly. can I book you for a session to get all those ske- those stretches and all that, please? And then yes, yes. Well, and that's a huge stuff. part. Yeah, that's a huge part of of what I do as a coach. Is you know, people will come to me and they'll say. I don't do any kind of vocal warm up. Can we just book a session where you just show me, like, give me, you know, the basics? And I say, okay, you know, here's a five minute warm up to do before you start recording. Here's a two minute warm up to do in between takes. And here's a little cool down. And that's just your routine. And I'll see you again if you need me. And if not, you should be good to go. Yep. That's because I think Namioho Renge Kyo over and over again isn't really getting you any stretches. So, okay. Yes, that's exactly. Cause it's like a vocal stack. I always say Nick Redmond gave me a vocal stack, but I think since yeah. then my situation's changed and my voice has changed. But to me, it's the same as when you go to an engineer and you say, here's my raw audio. Can you give me the mastering steps, the stack yeah. they call it to, yeah. to end up with my perfect. And we run it through the stack, the preset stack they've given us. So I think that I like the idea of having like a vocal stack of your yeah. voice that you just like run through that as if you're mastering your voice before it's going into the audio. And that's such a great way to be thinking about it. You know, I, I use a lot of sports metaphors 
Um, a professional athlete is not going to roll out of bed and then just go right into the game and assume that they're instantly going to start playing at the top of their game. That person woke up, they hydrated, they warmed up, they did some practice shots. Now I'm not saying that that's necessarily what you guys need to do, but it's, but if you're not doing anything before you step into the booth, you're using the game as your practice, if that makes mm. sense. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what about the mind body connection and the fear? Because I think that was the biggest part of me when I contacted mm -hmm. you, it was like last year, I think, I don't even remember how long ago it was, but the fear when you lose touch and you don't know where to go and you think something could be wrong and this is your livelihood. And you and I had mentioned before the call when I had said, I'm not going to be 100% authentic on this call because I don't want to give the impression that like I don't have a voice. I'm working every day and I'm fine. But yeah. we had said that it's really important that people feel, you had said that. I had said, I'm not going to tell anyone. They're going to all think I'm perfect. <laughs> and, well, but, and I think- you know, you know, I, I feel really strongly about this. Um, and one of the physicians I work with, um, Dr. Lucian Slika, has this phrase that he calls decatastrophizing vocal injury because performers truly do view it as a catastrophe. Yeah. And there is so much shame and so much secrecy amongst performers because it's viewed as a death sentence. And to go back to your original question, you know, what do I want people to know? I want people to know that you shouldn't be ashamed. It really shouldn't be a secret because professional athletes, it's not a secret that they get injured. And no one says that they're getting injured because they're bad at their sport. Uh, you know, I also have dance background, you know, show me a dancer that isn't injured. It's just understood that what they're doing to their bodies is just inherently, you know, strenuous enough that there's going to be some bumps along the way. No one's if shaming them. feet are like, bloody all the time and mangled and it's just normal again i'm not suggesting that everybody have bloody mangled vocal folds right. <laughs> you know, i do right. want everyone to have nice healthy vocal folds <laughs> but i think but i think the point is is that some of the fear is is kind of a natural reaction to oh i don't understand what's happening with my body i don't feel like i have control over what's going on with my body and some of it i think is imposed by the industry and that's truly unnecessary. Um, I cannot tell you, you know, when I'm invited to speak at, at conferences and workshops, I know people, you know, I'm see there are patients and former clients there for, you know, for everything is protected by HIPAA. I'm not allowed to kind of talk about anybody's case. So I don't say anything, you know, unless yeah, they come up to me. I don't one of us, we won't even admit we had a cold ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm sympathetic because, you know, I, again, I work with a ton of performers and I'm very sympathetic. You don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize your career. You don't want to rock the boat, but I really feel like the industry needs to be taken to task a bit and support people. Um, because this is, this is just a natural consequence in many cases of, you know, the demands that we place on, on this part of our body. Um, okay. So I would encourage people, you know, if you find yourself in that kind of panic, shame spiral, you're, it's not your fault. And it's it not your fault. It, worse. it makes it so, the, if I think about it, I get sick. If I yeah. don't think about it. Okay. I have, I have a question here and yes. I just have to preface this with, I don't know if I should use the person's name, the MMA person. Is it okay if I use, Okay. Oh my God, I just have to say, you announced MMA fights. You were like so cool. I knew you were cool. I didn't know you were that cool. So question from Kim. Pre-pandemic, I announced a few MMA fights. Oh my God. I stayed hydrated and did vocal, did warm-ups and then took two days of post to recover. I'd love to do them again, but I'm worried about damaging my voice. Is there a way to ensure against damage when doing something like that? So cool. <laughs> First of all, a hundred percent agree. That is very cool. Isn't it? Um, 
I, yeah. So I think you're coming at it from a really smart perspective, knowing that you have to warm up. I don't know enough of the details about what the announcing entails in terms of like amplification or where you're, you know, seated because the joke that I make with a lot of my patients is there are machines that make you loud. There's no machine that makes your voice smooth or clear. You know, you're, you're responsible for the quality you can always, you know, have tech to, to make you sound big and booming, um, from a volume perspective. So yes, I, you know, going back to the idea of use it or lose it, I think you would need to kind of, you would need to have a warm up set and you would need to practice kind of phrase it. Like if you knew that there were certain phrases that you would be saying, I would want you practicing, those phrases. I would want to make sure that you feel like you can say them without constriction, without tension, without pain or discomfort. And you'd want to, again, I don't know enough about MMA to know the duration and how much of it you're announcing, you know, how much of it is you speaking and at what volume, but you don't want to go from zero to 60. You want to make sure that you are both able to form the sounds healthfully and that you can sustain it for the required period of time and that you have a cool down (laughs) afterwards. (laughs) So, so with, with the muscle, oh, and, and you have to send me a message and tell me what outfit you wore because that is so cool. I'm trying to picture it. It's like already thinking if I were doing an MMA, this, so you got to tell me, um, but I'm wondering, cause you're saying the voice is a muscle and if yeah. you use it, you lo- don't lo- use it, you lose it. So what if somebody's not been doing proper exercises this whole time and say, um, asking for a friend, obviously not me, this person had narrated for like seven years, would that nar- daily narrating, wouldn't that have been keeping their voice in shape? So that, So can you build back if you then start doing exercises or is it like, being a couch potato for 20 years, good luck. I absolutely, you know, everybody's body has the capacity to get stronger. Listen, if we're talking about the difference between a 30 year old narrator and a 60 year old narrator, you know, obviously there's some aging effects that we can't counteract. But I think, you know, I don't, I don't want to come across today saying like, if you don't do a vocal warm up your work is, you know, (laughs) crap, you know, you're doing terrible work. There are a ton of people who are doing just fine and doing amazing work. And I, you know, the way to think about warm up is, is in terms of best practice, how to all do better. We all want to be the best us we can be. Exactly. It's just about keeping your voice as healthy as possible for as long as possible. That's really the way that I would think of it is, oh, this is a thing. Maybe if I start doing this, I could get more range. Maybe I wouldn't get tired as quickly. Maybe I could do longer sessions or maybe not. Maybe all it does, maybe you do it and you go, that Rachel person told me to do all these warm ups, and I don't know if they're really doing doing anything, but maybe it's just the thing that keeps you working for the next 20 years without a problem. Not a bad problem. And okay, so the water, which isn't six shots of espresso. It's just water. Is it true that if you chug like 1.5 liters of water when you wake up in the morning, that's not going to help that day's recording. You have to have been drinking water all day the day before and sipping it. Is that true? So, or is it a so, white tail? Oh man, there's so much to talk about with water. So There's two kinds of hydration. There's systemic hydration, which is like your whole body just being well hydrated. And then there's surface level hydration. So think about, you know, like me, for example, you know, it's pretty humid in New York. I'm I'm drinking water throughout the day. I think I'm pretty well hydrated. My hands are disgusting and cracking and peeling. Why that's, it's not because my whole body isn't hydrated. It's because the surface level is, is dehydrated. Okay. So your vocal folds benefit from both that systemic hydration and the surface level hydration. So the systemic hydration is exactly what you said, making sure that you've been drinking enough water and then giving the water time to actually go through your whole system 
and hydrate your body. So you're right. It's not like you chug a liter of water and then you're like, that's it. I'm instantly, my vocal folds are instantly hydrated. That water needs to be processed and and it needs to get through to the whole system. Um, But things like steam inhalation or nebulizers, you know, humidity that is sending hydration directly to the surface of the mucosa. And so that's another way to hydrate. So long, long answer to your question. You know, I can't speak to exactly like how many hours it takes, but in general, you just want to be continuously hydrating. What about that Pedialyte stuff? I got so desperate at one point. I was like on days when I know I'm going to have heavy recording, not taking a chance. I would like have Pedialyte just to make sure. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know that laryngologists or speech pathologists have a lot of evidence that if you drink Pedialyte, it's going to have like a significant impact on your vocal folds necessarily. But if you're someone who's, who's struggling to stay systemically well hydrated, yeah, have Pedialyte. Okay. Okay. So We've done our warm-ups, we've done our stretches, we've stopped being paranoid and freaking out so that our mental mind, our mental abilities calm. We're taking nice, lovely long breaks. Where yes. um and they just, don't even need to be that long, by the way. Sorry to interrupt, but even so, like a, a 10 minute break, five minutes, 10 minutes, just to kind of give give your body a moment to reset, do a couple of exercises, and then get back into it. Get into the game. And yeah. okay. Okay. And then we could be perfect. That's wonderful. That's <laughs> Rachel <laughs> Coleman will make you perfect. <laughs> That's not a bad tag. <laughs> that would be, that would be, a re- I'd be a real charlatan. <laughs> Well, that's the other thing. It's, it's, there's so much information out there. I think there is a time that you have to just look for letters behind someone's name. Sometimes. I'm really glad to hear you say that. I think this is less true in the world of coaching um, and for voiceover and audiobook narration. But I think for the world of singing, there's this very murky area where you've got people who are coaches or teachers who aren't medical professionals and say, but they say that they're going to rehabilitate you. I'm not saying that those people don't do amazing work and that they're not amazingly skilled. Um, there are a lot of incredible artists out there. And, and if you're a performer, you need those artists coaching you and guiding you and helping you improve from a skill standpoint. But if you really feel like you're dealing with a medical issue, my advice is just make sure that you're seeking help from a medical professional, like a licensed medical professional. Um, yeah. And, and then and not from Google. My lesson, <laughs> sorry, I, I interrupted you, but yeah, no, from my experience, this might be different in the UK than it is in the US. But mm-hmm. from a lesson I think I've learned is that you had to advocate for yourself when you go into your general practitioner and you have to say, I need to see someone. I don't know what the insurance is like in America. It could be completely different than over here, but over yeah. here, it, I learned that if I just go in and say, please, can you help me? I'm just going to be sent on these weird. I mean, I'm glad they tested me for lupus right. and I don't have lupus. Right. It was right, right. good of them to make sure, but right. every single one of those roads you go down, you know, once you have more information, you advocate for yourself and you're very clear about what you're asking. It's like, I think it's the same thing if you go to a coach. I always say that people come into this business and they start ticking the box of seeing all the coaches that people that they see posting their success on social media see, and they don't know who, why they're going to the coach. They don't yeah. have their questions set out. They just want to impress the coach and they're going because it's the thing to do. You've got to advocate for yourself, don't you? You have to have something yeah. about yourself. It's really true. I think fortunately in the States, it's a little easier um, if you have insurance to be able to just look up, you know, your local laryngologist and get an appointment. Maybe as a specialty practice, your insurance company, you know, you need your GP to kind of sign off on it for a referral. But if you find the provider that you want to see, you should be able to just go directly. See, and I like that. And I like 
the idea of people taking charge. Yeah. You don't, I mean, do you have people show up with you and just go fix me? And without yes. taking any responsibility for like, yes. what they're going to do. And, and sometimes I have to say, you know, the larynx is the technical term for the voice box. And I say, you know, I am not a larynx repair shop. I am the facilitator <laughs> and you are the doer. I, in yeah. theory, could make a lot more money if I could just pull your vocal folds out of your throat and fix them and then put them back in. It don't work that way. I show you what it takes for you to heal yourself. That's why I hate going to physical therapists because they make you do exercise at home. <laughs> it's like, I thought Bad news. Me. That's what voice therapy is. <laughs> and listen, if people, you know, if, if you're paying me privately and you want to pay me to exercise with you every damn day. <laughs> yeah. And that's why you go the personal trainer route, which I much prefer because then there's someone right, there you're afraid right. of. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. A very Machiavellian approach, right? <laughs> but I am saying that, please forget that I said that when I sent you an email asking to book for, because I really do think that I would, I think with me, the key is, it's like learning the accents and everything with all the homework. There are some people that are fascinated with the charts and the anatomy and, and they yeah. analyze in each language, the dialects and the differences. And then there's me. And I just like one bullet point so I can get on with acting and yeah. a few yeah, bullet yeah. point exercises that you can just do. Yeah. You know what I mean? And everyone learns differently. Everybody responds to different things. I think just like a good teacher, a good coach, a good therapist is going to meet you where you are. They're not yeah. going to say like, you have, this is how I do it. And you have to do it this way. Yeah. Our job is to have a lot of tricks in our bag and to kind of present them to you and figure out like, okay, what, what's going to work best for you? How do I get what I want for you and, and meet your goals and get what you want for you? Do you take your own advice with all your train, with all your training in the medical stuff? Are you quite good at making yourself do the healthy stuff? Or That's do you sit such there and a great go, question. Oh. That's such a great question. So you know, one thing, you know, one of the reasons why I'm wearing my dorky headset is the first thing I say to people in a pandemic world, if you're on the computer all the time, you know, take it easy on your voice, make sure you've got amplification. So in that way, you know, this is an example of me taking my own advice, you know, for the smallest thing, whether it's an interview or a meeting or, you know, a session with a client, this is just on my head. Um, you know, I tell people, keep your water handy. I do a lot of, um, vocal exercises using straws. And I tell people, you know, just keep a glass of water with a straw on your desk. And then it's always going to be there. You know, do I take my own advice about warming up and cooling down and doing exercises as frequently as I would like to? No, I am not as good as I should be. Um, none but of there, us are as good as we, but none be. of us are as good as we should be. <laughs> and, you know, you, you do the best you can. And yeah. some days my vocal warm up is, you know, doing some yawns and humming a little bit before the session. Sometimes I'm doing a little laryngeal massage. If I feel like mm, I'm, I'm getting a little tight and getting a little strained in a perfect world, I would be doing a five minute warm up every morning before I got to work, before I logged on for the first client doing my cool down afterwards instead of running to pick up my kids. <laughs> and, and that's, am, uh, am I wrong? I remember, I think it was you. Did you need a hard out at, on the hour? I have, yeah, five. Yes. I, I can I can swing another five minutes, unfortunately. Okay, I, I, I wanna, wish I could I just stay and talk forever. <laughs> no, thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. Yeah, five okay. minutes. I'm going to hit you with the very last question then. Yeah. Give you time to say it. So yeah. for the sake of the YouTube audience, it's going to be watching this in the next 60 years. What is the one, so just an easy question here. What is the one bit of wisdom or advice if they learn nothing else and remember nothing else and just sit and swig whiskey before recording and never take a break? What is the one word of advice that you would like to leave people with or thing that they should remember? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the most important thing is knowing when to seek help. And I think everyone is very quick to attribute voice problems. Oh, it's allergies. You know, oh, it's, it's the, you know, I'm just, I'm dehydrated. You know, maybe, maybe not. 
if, if you are having a persistent change to your voice and you're not sick and it's not getting better and, and it's just impacting your ability to work, get medical attention. The worst thing that happens is that they tell you that you're totally healthy and it's a total waste of time. And you can be like that Rachel lady told me to go to the doctor and it really was allergies. Well, great. I, I hope, <laughs> I hope that that's true. Rather than later, huh? Just don't, don't panic. It's not a cause for panic. Don't start Googling. Really the only way to know the answer is to have someone look down your throat. And there are people who are extremely competent, who want to help you, who specialize in working with performers and they won't hurt you. <laughs> it will be very quick and, and they'll help you do your job as healthfully as possible. So that's, that. Very well. that's my wisdom. And don't feel ashamed. Don't, don't, no shame, no shame. Yeah, we're because narrators are like the ninjas of the voice world. I it's mean, really seriously, true. guys, remember when you started, it wasn't as easy as you thought it would be, is it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's I think really we true. forget that. We forget, like, the first time you do a finished hour, a whole hour, you're like, and now, like, years later, it's like, oh, God, I'm going back. Okay, I'm going to let you go because thank you. we promised by thank you so much for joining us this has been a wonderful call thank you so much for having me it was so wonderful to get to chat with you to answer all the questions um, if anyone else has questions you can reach out to me directly you can find me my website is rc speech and voice all spelled out um, dot com my email, if you want to email me directly, RC speech and voice, all spelled out at gmail.com. And also it will be in the about section of the video. Oh, perfect. Perfect, well. perfect. No, but it's good that you said that as well, because people, if they don't read it, they'll hear it. So <laughs> Excellent. Happy to answer anyone's questions or, or to meet with anyone if they feel like they're, they're interested in uh, working more. And the video will be up in two weeks, which I'm kind Yay. of glad about because then I can book a session before the 8 million other people. <laughs> Great. Well, let's, let's hope that, that's, <laughs> that it comes to pass. Thanks it was so really much. nice chatting with everyone. Thanks, Have a wonderful Thanks, rest guys. of your day. Bye. 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 Bye.